We all look for permanence. We all look for something that is eternal, but we look in the wrong way. You know, we want the perfect love, eternal love, me and you, happy forever after, yeah? So we look for that in relationships, or we want a perfect career, or money security. And that seems to be the eternal that we're looking for. And then it's possible, you know, when it's the right time, you know, and it's a gift. I insist, I say this already, but it's important we understand. It's a gift we understand that permanence is something else. It's not for, you know, not everybody's gifted for this. You know, everybody will be, but not at the same time. Like, you know, spring times comes, not all flowers bloom at the same time. Namaste Shakti Ji. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this space together, Deepak. How are you doing? I'm good. And Shakti Ji, as we discussed briefly, we'll let this conversation be a free-flowing one, whatever appeals to our heart, and we'll see where the conversation leads us. Uh, before we start, Shakti Ji, could you just give a brief intro of who you are, what your journey has been till now? Um... I'm sharing a message of uh, awakening to our true nature as uh, the one consciousness that lives through all beings and unfolds itself as, as life, as existence, and uh, realizes itself through all forms. And this message came uh, through an opening that uh, arrived around the age of uh, 27 after many... Um, insights um, we could call satori yeah that happened since young age and it kept on unfolding is keeping on unfolding until now now i'm 48 so many years pass by and since many years um, i've been invited by my teachers to share these uh, insights um, i waited some years before being more public and uh, since, let's say, 2011, I started to be more public and uh, to, to share this uh, through satsang and seminars around the world, uh, in Europe and United States and Canada, and, uh, and online, of course. And this message is a message very simple. It's inviting everybody to inquire about what is truly living to your form. What is that is conscious of your body and your mind? What is that is witnessing the movements of your spirit? What is the meaning of life? Why all this is happening? And these questions, that's my discovery. That is an ongoing, an ongoing discovery, as I said, is that the answer to these questions lies within. Not in the mind, not in a thought or an idea or a concept, not in a feeling or any energetic experience, but in the deep nature of ourself. And so the journey that I offer is a journey of unbuilding layer after layer what is not true in us until the truth that is the mystery of our being remains naked and it can shine then in our life in whatever we do in our gaze in our words in our relationships whatever is our job or occupation we embody this realization that's it in a nutshell i would say uh, shakti she will invite you to take us forward in this journey but uh, uh, one question which often comes up in, in the conversation which I have also with bigness is why are these questions which you mentioned or this inward self-inquiry journey, mm -hmm. why is it needed? Why is it important? I mean, everybody yeah. around us, majority of the world is simply living their lives. So yeah. why should one move in this direction? Well, you're right. Everybody's simply living their life, but everybody has a goal. Everybody has something that keep them going yeah so for the majority of people safety because maybe they don't have enough to eat or they don't have a safe shelter 
or they don't live in a safe country is so survival is the most important and we must remember that those who are privileged to be on a spiritual inquiry they are gifted by this possibility for the majority of people this is not an option mm. just to go to the next day is the option of keep themselves alive or safe but for some of us independently from our economic conditions and uh, social conditions or whatever condition the attention starts to go within and to question things that are given for granted like i'm a person separated from the others separated from life why even if i achieved what i wanted or why even if you know i have little satisfaction from the word the word i i mean why i'm not happy why i'm not in joy why there is always an out of key sound in me why there is always a suffering a pain a fear a sadness a contraction that is there even when i'm successful i'm afraid to lose what i've got or if i don't get what i want i'm afraid of not getting it why is never enough why i feel the bucket and there is a hole on the bottom and it's never full and so some of us are gifted by having this drive of questioning is it really having a family or having a career you know what life is about it's just this is just survival mode the you know the only driving life or maybe we are here for something more and some of us have this little bug in their mind <laughs> and you know i would say for a lot of people this little bug it's keep kept at bay maybe until the end of life you know when facing death and say what a minute i'm not bringing with me any money i'm not bringing mm -hmm. with me any knowledge i'm not bringing with me my children or or, or spouse or or husband what am i going to do what is next you know the majority of us don't question these things until they're forced by life but some of us are weird <laughs> and we say we ask this maybe very young you know some of my students are very young some are even teenagers you know um there are very young people around me and not ju not just old seekers and you know and it's there is a hunger within for truth there is a questioning you know you know like nowadays we question everything we are very rebellious you know all institutions um the system you know how we call it it's kind of crumbling down and uh, we see it you know um not as reliable as before many institutions are seen no more as reliable so also young people feel very lost and they they try to find something else deeper safer more steady and some of them they start to have a spiritual quest and they don't even know it you know some people they're actually spiritually inquiring but they don't know it you know they might transfer it to politics or social teams and of course there is nothing wrong with these things you know it's they're beautiful and important but what they should inspire ultimately in my opinion is a sense of oneness a sense of finding the fundamental thing that join us all that we into it it's there so i would say that you know as i said there are you know what we call spiritual seekers are the one that have been recognizing this drive they have been not addressing it towards external experiences but they have just stay with the question this is a really great teaching can i stay with my questions without trying forcefully immediately to find an answer in my mind through reasoning you see this is already a great quality of a spiritual seeker 
or an aspirant to being a real seeker is somebody that can cherish their questions more than the you know fast forward immediate answer that you can find the one that can stay with calmness curiosity openness empty of opinions and uh, or pre let's say pre-made opinions of conditioning with their questions then their questions because they are coming from a very deep place this question who am i what is life these questions come from the truth in us then this question will start to germinate in us will make us develop an inner look not just an outside look looking in the world for an answer and then the direction reverse is no more so external is inner and in that inner questioning you know layers deeper and deeper and deeper of understanding starts to unfold and that's when usually you know we might find at a certain point when we become ready you know when we less agitated we be, we become ready then a teacher can appear a master a guide you know that reflects the quality of our sincerity before then we are a bit lost like you know wandering in the darkness and not knowing where to go but we have to become um i love gardening so i use this expression we have to become gardeners of our own mind we have to cultivate this quality of sincerity honesty calmness detachment sincere discernment these qualities will prepare us and then the teaching will arrive for sure shaktishi one uh, thing which which is often uh, sort of presented as a counterpoint to the inward journey is that there is a hint of passivity in in this journey uh, whichever direction we approach it from the direction of the witness consciousness or from the direction of the buddhist equanimity mm-hmm. there always seems to be this kind of thing that are am i becoming too passive mm-hmm. and if i am becoming too passive then the world will pass me by or my own physical mm-hmm. ambitions which also hold some importance in this world mm-hmm. they they might just not be possible for me So how does one balance this question of active life versus passivity? I would say that a, a true aspirant to truth should always be um uh, very balanced in life, very grounded, you know. If you have family um duties or social duties, you should comply to them with honesty sincerity calmness detachment discernment the quality i said before because you see life is the real guru is the ultimate guru if we cannot apply these things in our everyday life how can we even hope to apply them to going through the hell of our ignorance inside we cannot for sure go through the many layers of fears and contraction and stratification of karmic impression that have been impressed in us in thousands of years you know without being even able to speak in a decent way to our colleagues or to be decent in our work with other people or with our family so fanatism ideologism you know um fairy tale attitude of spirituality it's not a good attitude chop the wood and carry the water be practical you know do what life is asking you to do if life is asking you to be you know um a family man you know or a mother or taking care of your parents or whatever that's what the divine guru that is the divine mother that is life is asking you to do so first that you know comply to that with these qualities that i listed mm. and then you will see that 
there is a deep correspondence between your apparent external life and internal one. You will start to see a coinciding of patterns, movement, currents that happen in your everyday life and your inner journey. You'll start to be quiet enough to observe yourself. Witnessing does not require that you stay still. Witnessing is something that does not happen to the mind or to the body. The mind and the body are the objects of the witnessing. So, contemplative life, like a monk or a nun, is a life for some people. But not even a nun or a monk in a monastery, they stay still all day. Of course, there are great yogi in your country that, you know, their life has been become so subtle that, you know, they're able to stay in meditation several hours per day, you know, in samadhi for many hours. And these are beings that without them, we would kill each other. They hold the balance of the planet. But I would not concern with that because there are so few, you know. The majority of people, you need to have your worthy life and, and it's fine. And I'm not inviting them to stop doing it. I'm inviting to do it in a witnessing attitude. So to be tidy in your life will help you to be tidy in your mind. And a tidy mind, you know, develops a quality of helping you to discern what is real but what is not. So would you say that for each of us, the journey is different based on where we are, but the destination is pretty much that one space which we are looking forward towards, maybe searching for that permanence in the sea of impermanence? We all look for permanence. We all look for something that is eternal, but we look in the wrong way. You know, we want the perfect love, eternal love, me and you, happy forever after, yeah? So we look for that in relationships, or we want the perfect career, or money security. And that seems to be the eternal that we're looking for. And then it's possible, you know, when it's the right time, you know, and it's a gift. I insist, I say this already, but it's important we understand. It's a gift we understand that permanence is something else. It's not for, you know, not everybody's gifted for this. You know, everybody will be, but not at the same time. Like, you know, springtime comes, not all flowers bloom at the same time. So we, when we want more, when we ache for something deeper, you know, that is the surface of life, then, you know, it starts this journey. Now, let me say you something. It looks like we have different minds, yeah? But this is just because we look at the surface of the ocean and we see waves. But all these different waves comes from one current of one ocean of consciousness. There is only one mind. So this means that whoever has been realizing themselves in the past, the great teachers, the great masters, the great guru, the great avatara of this world, of any religion and tradition, they did the same step. Not only. It was the same one doing it. It's you. So it means that you already did it through those forms. And now you're doing it through that form that you call yourself. This is just to give a little of encouragement to everybody. Right. So give us something, some more pointers, Shaktiji. What is this space, this thing, this permanence we are looking for? You, you mentioned the example of ocean and waves. What are we looking for? And how do we, I mean, what is its nature? How do we recognize it? Well, look around the space you are, you know. Um, you're in a room, you know, there are many objects, many colors, many forms, correct? And when you look outside, you see the differences of the various materials, sound, 
you know, tactile sensations that are there. But then there is something in you that is aware of this multitude of objects and sound and colors and thoughts and feelings. And if you observe it from this space within, it is aware of these things. And it's possible you glimpse that they're all happening in one space. The multitude is happening in a oneness. This oneness is you. That's where meditation starts, from this. So, for instance, you can use my voice. It's an object. Yeah. The feeling of the chair you're sitting or if you're listening to this podcast and you're standing, the feeling of your feet, the sounds or the noises that are in your surrounded, surrounding, all the experiences, include them. Don't exclude them. Include them in your gaze. Include them in your contemplation. Sounds, colors, foods, physical sensations, thoughts, emotions, if you are there. What in you is aware of them? Don't answer with a concept in the mind. But look, what is your first-hand experience? What is that is conscious? What is that is aware in you of all this? And you find that there is a presence that in itself has no color, no shape. It's not a sound. It's not a thought. It's not a feeling. Is listening my voice. Is listening any noise of the place you are in. Is listening your physical sensations, thoughts, emotions. The inner and external world is included in this presence that you are. It's not in the mind. The mind, it's happening in this presence, is the real you is the eye of all and is the same eye of you and me same same eye it is the same presence it is viewing your inner and external world it's the same it's empty of any qualification and if you can live from this recognition any moment of your day, life appears differently. Still do what you need to do. But you see who you are. And from here, true knowledge, true wisdom comes. Wisdom is different from knowledge. Wisdom comes from experience. Knowledge comes from books. Thank you for asking. Shaktiji, the space is indeed different once we move into this uh, this sort of an inward contemplation of uh, moving beyond layers. What are my eyes aware of the mind and what is who, who is aware of the mind? But then there is this step which you mentioned that the one who's aware here is also the one, the eye who is aware on this side of the screen is the same I that is aware on that side of the screen, countries apart. Could you just put some more explanation into that? How does that function? Well, this must be recognized. So if you don't recognize it, I will explain it to you. But the explanation, consider it as a, a recipe for making the cake and it's not equivalent to actually eating it. <laughs> yeah? So. The explanation is, if what in me is aware, and you can see that, it's not a thought, it's not a feeling, it's not a sound, it's not a color, it's not anything that can be qualified because it's what is aware of any qualification whatsoever. It's nothing. You cannot have two nothings. 
so means we are one. Advaita, not two. Yeah, but this is the explanation. As you stay in the witnessing, the experience comes. The experience must come by actually experiencing the witnessing. Don't try to be one. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But just remain in this observation. And at a certain point, the hypnosis of getting a touch with what you see, you know, goes down, the veil is lifted, and the attention goes in what is aware of what you're watching. In what is aware of what you're watching lies your true nature. And how would one live from the space so I can understand, you know, for example, in the session, in this short session, which you just did, uh, there is a recognition or there, the intention is to have some sort of a recognition, but then we will move out into the real world with the traffic and the cars and somebody well, shouting. Not. This is real world to me. No, mm -hmm. we are not in another place. We are not on another planet. There is a sacredness if you want in this talk, because we are talking about something that intuitively our mind is recognizing as sacred because it's coming before the mind. Yeah? So intuitively we feel it has to be revered and it's special, it's sacred. Yeah? But yet this conversation happens in the real world, in the duality game. Yeah? So, what's the difference? Maybe when the interview is finished, your attention comes back, you know, the, again with just identification with being Deepak or doing what you need to do. So that's the difference. It's your attention that is different. But the sacredness of life is always here. Always. It doesn't go away. Any moment can be your sadhana. Any moment must become your sadhana if you're a sincere seeker. Otherwise, meditation becomes just like from 8 to 30 in the morning or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Or yoga class from 5 to 6. Yeah. That's not spiritual life. Becomes a hobby. Yeah. I have nothing against yoga. It's great. It's great science. It's very useful. But we cannot think that we are a seeker only when we sit cross legged and clo close our eyes. Because otherwise, we're just uh, making spirituality as an occupation. Spirituality flowers, real spirituality, from humbleness to stay with life. Now you're driving the car, that's what is happening. Be aware in you. You're going to be a much better driver. You're going to see much better all the cars coming. Now you're doing your chores, you're cleaning your house. Be aware of you as you clean your house. Now you're talking with somebody, you know, be aware. Be open. Remain in the listening. Any moment of the day, that's a spiritual life. That's a, a life that very rapidly actually leads to changes in the personality, in the suffering, in the contraction that leads to suffer. So there is a sacredness in the space which we are currently sharing. That is true. But also uh, in the quote unquote real world, yeah. there are these there are these intense emotions or intense surroundings which we face grief for example so there, there are certain things which which always have or have had a potential to just blow us away from our path how how would you tell your students or how would you uh, give us some pointers to face those mm -hmm. things well as i say before the sacredness is not in this interview life is always sacred but it's our gaze that is not always in the right direction so the sacredness is all the time. So this means that any moment of life can be a pointer to wake up to our true nature. And sometimes um, 
let's call it divine grace, comes in a way that is unexpected. So it can come to um, a relationship that is breaking or um, a divorce or, you know, a failure in work or being fired. And, and that disappointment, that grief, that pain, is showing us where we have been attached. Now, the quality that we could develop if we have been developing a quality of witnessing before, because as I say often, we ask the meditation to help us when we are desperate, you know, and we are like somebody that is trying to tame a fire where has been already becoming wild and is taking all the house. Instead, if we develop, you know, this, this quiet calmness, this attitude of witnessing all the time, in good times and bad times, we should especially meditate when we're happy, you know, and healthy. It's easier. Mm -hmm. So then when things are not easy, we already have a grounding. We already have a basic ground out of which we can face these emotions. But for the majority of peop people, it's not this. Majority of people say, oh no, you know, I don't know anymore. You know, all my compensation and strategies are not working anymore. Then I, I will find refuge in meditation and I'll become spiritual. I'm going for a spiritual retreat or whatever, you know. Because our mind is so, I mean, our mind just wants the next object, you know. We're going, like in a vendor, we put our coin and we get our bubble water or whatever, you know. We just, oh, I want awakening. Like that. It doesn't work like that. It works through love and humbleness. It doesn't work. It works through devotion to life. It doesn't work through, I want this because nothing else worked, yeah. But our mind is like, this is very rough, usually, very agitated. So um, so let's say you've never done anything in your life and uh, now you're, you know, you're broke or, you're, or your heart is broken and you need help, you know, and nothing else worked, not even your therapy or whatever, yeah? You can recognize that there is pain in your heart and you can't send it away. You tried, you open the fridge, you open the social, you call the mom, the doctor, the friends, it doesn't work. Then you could discover that you can learn to stay with that pain instead of sending it away. You can invite it to, let's say, let's use this old fashioned expression, to take a tea in your heart. You don't send it away. You don't push it away. You just let it be. And you cannot fake it. You cannot say, okay, I'm inviting the pain in my heart to take a tea so it goes away more quickly. It doesn't work like that. It's, you learned that there is, you can learn that there is something in you that is this presence, actually, that can stay with pain. And then something happens you start to learn from that pain. You start to let the medicine that that pain brought in your life and start to, to come out. And maybe this pain shows you where you are a fool, where you are deluded, where you were stubborn, where you were violent. And then when it is time, it, when it has been given all the lesson, it will go away. And it, if you do this at least one time in your life, you learn it. And you do it with everything. And then as Mablana Rumi said, your heart becomes like a guest house. Any misery, any anguish, any depression, any unfortunate event can knock at the door of your heart. You let it come. You let it do what they want. You welcome with a smile, no matter what. And then they go. And you learn that life is not punishment. Life is not against you. Life is trying to teach you, like a good mother. You know, when you learn to walk 
you have been falling many times. Sometimes you need to fall to learn to walk. Each jivan, each, each individual aspect of this absolute Brahman that we are, has his own way to come back home, to recognize the oneness with everything. Yeah? And for some of us, unfortunate events are the way, and it's not punishment, it's a lesson. But we need to learn how to listen to the lesson. And the way is to step back from our usual identification with the mind into, into a space of listening. In the space of listening, meditation can happen. That's the way. If you try any other way, you're like a thief. You can stay. The only real door, the main entrance, is this. Behind your mind. Behind your senses. Yeah? Nowadays, there are... It's very fashionable, for instance, um, medicine plant and ayahuasca and all these things. And although they can give a temporary opening to other dimensions of understanding your realities, they're windows. You're entering through the windows. You're not entering through the main door. You kind of stay. And then sometimes it's not easy to stay with the aftermath of what you sow because it's hard to integrate it in your life. So don't be a thief. Don't enter in your heart or through the window. Enter to the main entrance. That's it. The heart is the abode of consciousness, not the physical heart. It's not an emotion. It's not a physical organ. It's the abode of consciousness. That's where the real guru is. Hmm? The real guru is in your heart and it shines out as life. If you understand this, you understood everything. I'm always awestruck, Shakti Ji, as, as how simple this all looks and feels. Uh, so simple and yet so sophisticated and there are actually no questions or answers to be put forward because if if we start going in the direction in which we are pointing, uh, I mean, we can try to wheedle out different complications, but in essence, there are no complications, are there? It's, it's pretty simple. Well, yeah, but the mind is complicated. Mm. <laughs> so the mind will try to complicate it and it's okay and you see I would say that the notion that can be useful for whoever is listening to this interview is to start to understand that nothing is against us and uh, life is not against us life in whatever way comes is coming for showing us one thing only what we really are. We're not here just to reproduce ourselves and to find in our son and children eternity or whatever, you know, to live on an animal level. We are here to recognize what we really are. So we have to develop our spiritual nature. Our animal nature should be cherished and loved in the same way as an adult, adult takes care of a child. That's the way in which we should take care of our body and our ordinary life. And that's perfect, yeah, as I said. But we start, we must start to, to, to educate, to grow this spiritual nature, this transcendental nature of ours. Because we are spiritual beings in human form. So when this dimension starts to grow in our life, and as I said, it's not for everybody at the beginning. When this dimension starts to grow in us, then we see that the path, it's not complicated, but it's tough. Because it means to meet all our fears, all of them. To meet them in our heart, to burn them to the ground. And from the sacred ashes, something new comes, our true self. That's what we are here for. And life is helping us in this task. That's why we are alive here on this dual game. Right. Something which you 
mentioned in this segment was uh, life is not against us is something which we need to recognize. But then again, how do we reconcile with this apparent unfairness of life? And initially also we mentioned wars and that there are different catastrophes which are impacting us. How do we reconcile these two things? Well, I don't want to sound too complicated, but to understand that nothing is unfair, we should have very broad eyes because our windows of observation of and our meter of judgment of fair and unfair is very limited. Now, if we look at just at our animal form, yeah, the body mind, we can say it's very unfair. You know, that young child, that person that was so good, you know, the hope of that couple destroyed by whatever. Yeah. But then when we start to include our spiritual part, we start to be taught, yeah, that any test we meet in life, any lesson we receive has a meaning. And through that meaning we grow spiritually. And without that test we wouldn't. We don't know what we have been experiencing before. We don't know which lesson we need because we don't remember our previous lifetimes. We don't know where we come from in that way. Yeah? So a person that has, let's say, you know, let's take, you know, a family that has only one child and that child is sick and he dies very early. We don't know who is that soul. Often that soul is a very noble old soul that comes to bring understanding to the parents and that sacrifices itself to have a very short and intense life to bring love in the life of the parents. We don't know. We don't know who is the beggar on the street. We don't know why he's a beggar, you know. So it's with our very narrow mind that we judge. And this does not mean to not to honor life and to help who is in need. We, we, are, we have the duty to serve life, to love everybody and everything around us, to recognize divine consciousness in everybody and everything. That's our duty, yeah? As more as you grow, the more you feel this duty, yeah? But never ever we can say this shouldn't happen if life made it happen. We can say it when we are at the beginning of our journey because our eyes are closed. But to an aspirant to awakening, this cannot be said. We can only say, I don't understand. Please, Divine Guru, help me to understand because I feel so much pain in front of this event. It feels, it, it crushes my heart, you know. If we can dev develop this strength that I'm speaking of, then I can promise you, dear Deepak, you will see why certain events happen in life. And all will remain in you is gratefulness and love and awe from life. Yeah. I shouldn't, it shouldn't be me reminding you something that belongs to your culture. Yeah, that is the Bhagavad Gita when Krishna said to Arjuna, the one that are killing and the one that believe to be killing and the one that believe to be killed are both under an illusion. Yeah. Arjuna is tormented because he doesn't want to kill his family, basically. But he has to do it. You know, and Krishna is saying to him, your eyes are closed. I'm everything and everybody. I'm your, you know, your formidable bow and the arrow and everything just go ahead and see i'm everywhere and in the middle of that desperation that anguish arjuna wakes up it's a great story we say it's unfair we have to develop special eyes to understand that it's not unfair and we cannot ask to the ordinary people to have those special eyes so if you meet 
that ordinary person is not ready to see this sacredness of life that I'm speaking of. Don't be arrogant. Don't say to them, oh, it's because it's karma, you know, just stay with it. No, 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 no. Cry with them, hug them, help them, soothe their pain, listen. But inside, be open to understand. And when you will understand, you will become a vehicle of making this possible for them. You understand? It's not for everybody all the time to see this. But that's the ultimate truth. On a certain point, if we are good gardeners of our own mind, this comes and we can bring peace on earth. Whatever we do. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah I, I too like it, Shaktiji, especially uh, how we circled back to the first thing which you said was to live with the questions, to be the ability to, to live with those questions. And even at the end, what you just mentioned that, I mean, if something happens, it's absolutely a valid response to say, I don't understand it. But uh, looking at with that, that path as unfair might be signifying a little narrower vision, but also uh, it is not for everyone. So if somebody is really going through grief or, or something has happened, it's it's not the point to say that, oh, no, it's no. just witness it. I, I said it to you because you asked me, no? And this yes. is for you. So if you are in a place where there is just unfairness and sense of injustice, you know, just try, you know, instead of fighting against it, as I said before, it's valid what I said before. Try to see is from this space within, you can stay with it. And on a certain point, it will open up. You know, you cannot force this. It must come from authentic devotion to truth. Yeah? So, there is pain. You feel broken. You cry. Cry. Cry all your tears. Meet that pain completely. And then arrives a point in which there is more silence in you and you can stay with that pain. And staying with that pain doesn't mean to identify with the feeling or expressing it, yeah? It's not a cathartic expression. It is learning to stay with that fire, yeah? Imagine that a friend is coming to your house and their girlfriend or boyfriend just left them or they're just being fired, yeah? And they come to your house and they need to talk. You're a good friend. You let them speak. You let them explain. You let them cry. And you stay silent. You say a few words. You say, I understand. I hear you. Yeah? And then maybe when they've been emptying themselves of all this, then maybe, you know, you just hug. That's it. That's a good friend. Now, you have to be this good friend with you, with your pain, with your grief, yeah? with your fears. That's the teaching. Yeah? Not immediately is possible. At the beginning, maybe the mind well, just want to go mad, you know? Okay, go mad. But it's, you cannot go mad forever because it, it leads you nowhere. You're running on the spot. Yeah? At a certain point, after you've gone mad enough times, you're tired to go mad. That's when you're ready for spirituality. Yeah? That is very real, very human, very down to earth. I hope you can feel it. It's not ideological what I'm offering. It's very real. It works. Yeah? It does, Shaktiji, and uh, I, it's, it's really been wonderful the way you have shared different facets of of what life is and what who we are, in fact. Uh, before we end, Shakti Jam, uh, is there something more you would like to share? Otherwise, we'd love to end with, with anything which which has appealed to you in, in your own personal journey. Any saying, any poem, any verse, anything which you feel mm -hmm. is true, close to your heart. It comes into my mind, one great saint of the 14th century from India, and she was revered by the Muslim and the, and the Hindu because she was um, known as a saint and as a great sage of uh, 
um, uh, tantric Shaivaism in Kashmir, but she was also revered from the Muslim. And she's Lala Dead. I don't know if you know her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was very wild. She wasn't going around naked, you know, and that, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if you are still like naked sadhu in India, but, but, you know, I mean, a female uh, naked is quite something, especially mm -hmm. in the 15th century. And uh, she was just less with her long dreadlocks, yeah? And um, and she was a great, uh, she was teaching into poems, you know, when when true wisdom comes, it sounds like poetry, you know? And uh, one poet, of course, I can only uh, uh, quote it in English. Of course, it was not, um, she was just saying it, and then people mm. were writing down what she was saying, yeah? It was not in English. So uh, forgive me for the translation, will be for sure not perfectly correct. But it sounds like this, she said, Wrapped up in you, I search for you everywhere. And then I discover you were hiding within. At that point, I ran out wild. Now play me, now play you. <laughs> she was wonderful. Absolutely nice, uh, Shaktiji. Thank you for sharing that and also for sharing everything you have done in this in this 50-odd minutes. It's been really wonderful. Uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, as our intention was in the beginning, somebody gains something from this and then the journey remains what it is for everyone is at a different stage. But really so nice of you to come here and share your insights. Thank you so much. You, you are welcome. And I want to say if somebody had the patience to remain until now, I don't know, it's a long, long conversation. Whatever you're going through, you know, don't despair. Stop a moment. Close your eyes if you want. Go in your heart and try to say yes to it, whatever it is, for a second, and see what happens. That's it. Thank you. Much love to everybody and to you, dear Deepak. Thank you. Thank you, Shaktishi. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.